Feast of the Visitation of Our Lady. But also it's a time in the Ignatian Retreat where we consider today another visitation. The original visitation took place when the angel Gabriel appeared to the Blessed Virgin Mary and asked her to be the mother of God. She then responded to the angel, Fiat Miki Secundum Verbum Tuum. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. When she said that fiat, God the Son entered the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the fullness of his priesthood. A hypostatic union took place. <clears throat> and priest, the priest according to the order of Melchizedek, entered into this world. What was the effect of this visitation of heaven? The angel had told the Blessed Virgin Mary that she who is called barren, who could never have children, could never bear life, was already now in her sixth months with a child who is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, who will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, <clears throat> having our Lord Jesus Christ in her womb, in his priesthood, was driven to travel. And she made a visitation to her that was called barren. She carried Christ to her that was called barren. 33 years later, we find our now, this time in the Ignatian Retreat, where it is 3 p.m. on Good Friday. And that priest that entered the world 33 years earlier inside the womb of that mother now cries out with an exceedingly loud voice, and gives up the ghost. He is truly dead. 33 years before, that mother knew what that fiat meant. That that man, God, that entered into her womb was here to die. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. And now the word is complete. She was told only 40 days after his birth that she would be the mother of sorrows. That this child would be a sign of contradiction. That what was said by the angel would be done according to the word inside of Mary. She accepted this 33 years before. Now her son is dead. He passes down into limbo. His soul exits from the body. There is a true separation and true death. And Mary is left alone. It is something like the holy sacrifice of the Mass. When at the very end of the Mass, the priest says, Ite misa est. Go, it is sent. You have come here to this holy sacrifice. You have participated in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have consumed him. And his body disappears after a few moments inside of our bodies. Now go. What remains? 
Some theologians tell us <clears throat> that our Lord remains approximately seven minutes, maybe as long as seven minutes inside of our body after we receive Holy Communion. Probably less than that. And then the priest says, Ite Misa Est. This first Ite Misa Est came at 3 p.m. on Good Friday when our Lord Jesus Christ's body at that moment went out. The soul went out from the body and he was dead and all that remained was that ever was carried in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now she goes from the tomb and she makes a visitation. At 3 p.m. on Good Friday, what happens? When our Lord does truly die, the apostles are in the greatest of anguish that can be experienced by a human being. They experience the greatest of anguish because they could not imagine a moment without Christ. Now he's gone. Up until that moment, there was a hope of a miracle like that happened many times before. He escaped at Nazareth. He escaped from the midst of the crowd when they were going to stone him in the temple. So many times he was close to death and he escaped. And even though he is so scourged and so crowned with thorns and so nailed to the cross, something can be done and he can still escape. There's some kind of hope. But then at 3 p.m. he dies and he gives up the ghost and lets out an exceedingly loud voice that it might be known that he has truly given up the ghost. And he is truly dead. This causes the greatest anguish inside the heart of the apostles because they lose something that we cannot lose. They lose Christ himself. They do not believe he shall rise. They think it's over. The Blessed Virgin Mary carries him still in her heart. Now she has to be the one to hold the faith to hold our entire church together between this 3 p.m. on Good Friday and the early morning of Easter Sunday when he shall take on his victory. She knows the victory shall come, but it's a very long time. It won't be until the third day. The apostles are so sorrowful at the death of Christ it is enough to slay them. Many men have died of grief. And all 11 of these apostles are ready to die of grief. They need to be sustained in their grief. So the Blessed Virgin Mary should not have time to be with her own grief and her own sorrow. She must sustain the apostles in their sorrow. St. Peter comes to Mary and lets it be known that she has denied, he has denied him three times. The other apostles come to Mary and let it be known that they fled as cowards from the garden. And they watched from a distance this death. And they can't imagine, they couldn't imagine that it could happen. And they are so filled with grief and she simply sustains them. She visits their hearts and sustains them in grief. The mother of sorrows will share the sorrows of her apostles and hold them together. So they are held together by her. They will spend these three days with her and she shall sustain them. They're going to experience the sorrow that our Lord spoke of in the, when he said on Holy Thursday night, you shall be sorrowful, but the world shall rejoice. You're going to be sorrowful, the world shall rejoice. You will be sorrowful because a little while I am not with you and I go to the Father. But the world shall rejoice because they believe that I have been defeated. 
there is a great sorrow amongst the apostles. They will experience the only sorrow that is the most serious of sorrows, and it shall become a foundation of the motivation of the apostolicity of our church. Many men born in abject poverty, born in great hunger and difficulties, when they grow up and get married, they say, my children will never experience the poverty that I experienced. My children will never know the sorrows I knew. I will make sure they don't know it. Now, the apostles are learning during these three days between Holy Thursday to Good Friday, 3 p.m., and the third day in the resurrection in the morning, what real sorrow and what the only sorrow is, which is the absence of Christ. This sorrow is unbearable. And this is the only sorrow to be removed. It should be the motivational spirit of the church, or part of that essential motivational spirit of the church down the next 2,000 years. It will look out upon the world and see what the Blessed Virgin Mary saw three and a half years earlier. When she looked up and saw a starving, thirsting people <coughs> who were just in emptiness <coughs> and loneliness without God. Therefore she said to her son, Son, they have no wine. This spirit must be passed on to the apostles. And she will teach the apostles during these three days that the only tragedy in the world is the tragedy of not having wine. And one of the great tragedies of the modern church and the modern priesthood is the modern priest looks out at the world and he doesn't realize there's only one sorrow in this world, and that is this world without Christ, this world without our Lord, without the wine of his divine divinity, the wine of his humanity, the wine of his divine love, the wine of his words. This is what the world needs. They have no wine. But the modern priest is told, well, they, they have not enough money. They have not enough social justice. They don't have enough of the things of this world. They don't have enough peace in their hearts. They're disturbed by psychological disturbances, and they need medications, and they need guidance to bring back a sound psyche. When all that modern man needs is our Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts. The wine of our faith, the wine of charity. <clears throat> the Blessed Virgin Mary, when she saw the marriage feast at Cana, she saw the whole world and saw that they have no wine. It is the duty of the Pope, the duty of the bishops of the church, the duty of the priests, to look around the world and see what it's lacking and see what it's missing. It's missing wine. The apostles are now learning what this means by experience during these three days. <clears throat> they are experiencing the absence of the wine of Christ and their hearts are ripped apart. Remember when our Lord Jesus Christ died, they didn't just lose a friend. They didn't just lose a guide. They lost God himself. He decided everything about their moment, every moment of their lives. They did nothing without him. And now he is gone. They did, during the last three and a half years, they forgot about any decision, whether to eat or not eat, sleep or not sleep, walk or not walk, work or not work, play or not play. Every single activity and every word and every thought and every deed was simply centered on him, and they never thought of any other way than the way of being with him. And he was only 33 years old and the most perfect of health, and they'd only been with him for three and a half years, and they were going to be with him forever and bang, he is ripped out of their midst. He suddenly crucified, died, and is buried. <clears throat> and they experience the pain of the absence of Christ. Now they understand in their hearts what it means to have no wine. They can't live without this wine. How do they survive during this period? The Blessed Virgin Mary sustains them, for from her flesh came the flesh of God made man. 
And she is truly the mother of God. And she has the heart of Christ within her. And she explains, she shows them how to hold up in the, in the time of sorrow. So that when the church goes out to do its work throughout the world during the next 2,000 years, it will have the answer to all sorrows. Because all sorrows can be narrowed down to one. The absence of the wine of Christ. And the answer is the Blessed Virgin Mary to request her son to solve the problem by simply telling him they have no wine. He's in the process of making this wine from his own precious blood at the cross. He's in the process of making this wine able to go out to the world when he establishes his own mystical body as the church which will carry this sacred wine to the entire world down the next 2,000 years. And the apostles are there being sustained by Mary, and she is alone sustaining them during this period. St. Peter survives a grief of the three days because he is with her. <clears throat> the tragedy of Judas is that Judas committed suicide in the morning. If only he had waited. If he had just waited a few hours, he would have been able to understand. He would have been able to overcome his confusion. He would have been able to repent. But he couldn't wait. And instead of repenting unto the Lord, he, re he returned unto himself and he went to his own place. He did not return to Christ. He would not return to the Holy Mother. Therefore, he died and burns in hell. <clears throat> but the eleven were sustained by her. <clears throat> now when the death of our Lord Jesus Christ happened, it was made clear that he was indeed the Son of God. <clears throat> there was an earthquake. The sky was darkened. The dead rose and appeared to many. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom by heaven. Caiaphas came back to the temple in order to see the veil rent from top to bottom. God rent the temple, the veil of the temple, about 60 feet tall, a very long veil. And it was rent from top to bottom, bringing an end to the Old Testament, and the temple is no longer a holy place, no longer the place that held the presence of God. And Caiaphas, who was the last priest of the Old Testament, Stop being a priest. And it was wrenched apart. His priesthood ended. But what was he doing when his own priesthood ended? Our Lord said what would happen. The world shall rejoice. He rejoiced that finally Jesus Christ was dead. He did not realize he had brought the death to himself. The world shall rejoice. But note this concerning the rejoicing of the world. It is always very brief. It doesn't last very long. It comes quickly to an end. So he rejoiced. Though he saw the veil of the temple rimmed. He saw the damage of the temple from an earthquake. <clears throat> You heard about the dead rising. You saw the sky darkened. But he was so filled with hatred of Christ that only one thing was on his mind. He is finally dead. We can rejoice because Christ is dead. In this short time, we'll go out and finish the work by removing all the rest of his disciples from the planet Earth. The Blessed Virgin sustains the apostles. Then it comes to the time of three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning, early morning to the third day. And our Lord Jesus Christ rises from the dead. We know concerning this resurrection <clears throat> that it is an undeniable, infallible, historical fact. That the man, Jesus Christ, who lived 33 years upon this earth, who died before thousands and thousands of witnesses, 
on the Golgotha on Good Friday. It was buried in a tomb that was guarded by a maniple of soldiers, of 100 Roman soldiers, of the toughest army the world has ever known, so that no one might come and steal the body. On the third day in the early morning, a light came from that tomb. The stone was rolled back by an angel, and Christ came forth from the tomb. That's what happened. And they were frozen in fear as dead men. And they watched the stone roll back. And they watched the man within come out. The Roman centurion put into his report, We were guarding the tomb, lest someone come and steal the body. In the early morning on the third day, the stone was rolled back. The man in the central tomb came out and left. Realizing that our purpose for being there was no longer uh, required since the tomb was empty and he had left, we decided to depart the area. And so the soldiers left. They ran away in terror, leaving behind a big mess. And then what happened? Caiaphas and Annas didn't like this report, so they paid the soldiers to make an adjustment to their report, which adjustment proves definitively the historicity of the resurrection. They said in early morning, it didn't happen exactly like we said in our earlier report. In fact, we 100 soldiers were sleeping very soundly. And while we were sleeping, we saw 11 men Fishermen, cowards, afraid of their own shadow, stepping over our sleeping bodies. They then rolled back the stone, a very large stone that was sealed with the seal of the high priest, and we didn't hear it, but we saw it with our eyes because we were sleeping. They went in and took the body, and they carried it out. We didn't do anything about it because we were sleeping. This idiotic report, changing the report, proves definitively that the man, Jesus Christ, truly rose from the dead. And where did he go? The first place where he went was to his mother. We consider here this first apparition. <clears throat> the mother of sorrows had waited for the return of her son, and she is filled with the greatest of agony, but remember, she sent him to death. She had said 33 years earlier, Fiat, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And she would not have it any other way than that it be done according to thy word. And according to the word of the Old Testament, he should be a man of sorrows. He should have no comeliness in him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And she saw how on Holy Thursday, Good Friday evening, the prophecy was fulfilled when Longinus took a spear and pierced the side of our Lord. Out came blood and water, and he looked upon him whom he pierced. But not a bone of him was broken. <clears throat> she knew all these things were prophesied, and she willed them to heaven. She said, let the two happen. She said, let it be done. She also knew that on the third day, he would rise from his death. And he would defeat and conquer death. <clears throat> and so she waited. And when the morning of the third day came, <clears throat> our Lord Jesus Christ rose and appeared to his mother. We consider this apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We consider a few things. One is that <clears throat> The mother of sorrows was visited by the man of sorrows. <clears throat> and the union was most sacred. Whatever sorrow the man of sorrows had, and he has the greatest sorrows that anyone can have. <clears throat> and whatever sorrows the mother of sorrows of the seven sorrows had, <clears throat> the greatest sorrow that any human can have. When this meeting took place, all those sorrows were completely wiped out. They were completely obliterated. The sorrows were finished. 
the sorrows are complete. And there is a perfect joy of the first beatific vision, which we call heaven. The beatific vision that took place was the vision by which the Blessed Virgin Mary saw with absolute beauty and perfection her son risen from the dead. And whatever joy is in our Holy Mother, the Church, and there is an almost infinite joy in the saints of our Church, and whatever joy is found in our Church down the last 2,000 years and shall be found at the end of the world, it is simply an overflow simply a, a residue of the joy that is found in this sacred meeting between Our Lady and her son on Easter Sunday morning. It's a most sacred meeting. It's a short meeting, a brief meeting, one in which they look face to face. Because remember that the purpose of this death and the purpose of this life was to obey the Father and save souls. He will meet briefly with his mother and then he must go about his work. And she sends him again about his work. She will go and appear to St. Mary Magdalene, <clears throat> the Peter and the other apostles. He will go about his work. She sees him and the, all the sorrows are completely wiped out. There is a great silence in this meeting. This sacred meeting is one in which they see each other face to face and there is a perfect joy and completeness in this meeting. Bishop Sheen in a talk about silence made here in Kentucky back in 1948 <clears throat> at Gethsemane Monastery spoke about the reasons for silence in our holy church. Gethsemane is only a few miles away from here, about a 20 minute drive. <clears throat> He said, why are the monks that get Gethsemane silent and why is there silence in our holy church? Three reasons for silence. The third one is the one that applies here. The first reason for silence is guilt. We in the church are silent because we are sinners and we have no answer to God for our sins. Whereas it says in the parable of the wedding garment, the master walked in and he saw a man who had not on his wedding garment. And he said, friend, why dost thou not have on thy wedding garment? And he was silent because he didn't have an answer. So likewise, we walk into a church. We know that we are sinners and we have no excuse for our sinfulness. And therefore, we are silent. And the second reason for silence is that silence signifies consent. That when a command is given, we simply obey in silence. Like Samuel, the little boy, spoken three times by God, called three times by him. And finally, Heli told him, if you hear the word of the Lord again, say, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. And so he listens in silence to the command of the master. And the third reason for silence is love. And this is the reason of the sacred silence of the Blessed Virgin and, Saint jo and our Lord Jesus Christ in the meeting on Easter Sunday morning. <clears throat> that there is silence when there is love. A couple is married 50 years. She comes downstairs. The husband comes downstairs. She doesn't need to ask him, what would you like this morning? Would you like coffee and eggs? How many lumps of sugar do you want in your coffee? She does not need to ask because she's been with him for 50 years and she knows what he wants. Therefore, no need to ask. There also comes a point <clears throat> where the love is deep and words can no longer be a sufficient vehicle to carry the meaning of love. Two soldiers meet after having fought through the war and been through all kinds of trials together. <clears throat> they meet after many years and they simply shake hands. 
There is more in the silence said than could be said by any words. They just simply rejoice in the presence of one another. And there is no way to express all the things that they have experienced by words. Words are no longer a sufficient vehicle to carry the meaning on the depth of the love. And this is the reason why the Blessed Virgin simply is in the presence of her son. And she, he is simply in the presence of his mother. <clears throat> and there is simply a rejoicing and all the tears and sorrow of both Father and, and, and uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and his mother are completely wiped away. <clears throat> it is a sacred meeting. And then from it, Christ will go about his work. The last time that he had met her, he was on the way of the cross. <clears throat> she helped him stand from one of his falls and can't let him go on the way of the cross was at the foot of the cross that the great gift was made. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. One thing about the gifts of our Lord, it is like fire, says St. Augustine. Whenever you give food to someone else, you have less food for yourself. But when you give fire, like we do on Holy Saturday night, you take fire from your candle, you give it to another, and there is more fire. If you give fire even more, there is more fire. The fire is increased the more it is given. And this is the nature of the gifts that come from God. The more we give away, the more we have. The more fire there is. So our Lord Jesus Christ poured out the entirety of his sacred heart. She poured out the entirety of her immaculate heart in order that grace and salvation might be carried to the entire world and every soul might receive the divine love and the divine truth. The more they poured out, the more they spread the fire. Our Lord Jesus Christ speaks to that fire. He says, what will I but that their worth be set on fire? And what will I but that it be enkindled? The fire is increased. To teach us the effect of charity in our lives. The more we pour ourselves out for others, the more we imitate Christ, the more fire is within us. The brighter burns the flame. And so this flame burns so bright in the Blessed Virgin Mary, it burns so bright in our Lord Jesus Christ, and the flame spreads. Our Lord appears to his mother. There is an intense burning of the flame, the fire that burns out all sorrow. And now it spreads to the ends of the earth. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all grace. Every gift that comes to us from God passes through her hands. She had to say in the very beginning, Fiat, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And if she did not say that fiat, we are all damned. We have no hope. But she did say that, Fiat. She said yes to the angel Gabriel. She didn't have to, but she chose to. And when she said that yes, God the Son entered into her womb. And then he waited for her to say, they have no wine, before he began his public ministry. And then... We had to wait for her to say, do whatever he tells you before we can have the strength to obey him. If we obey Christ, it is because she heard, we heard her say, do whatever he tells you. All things pass through her hands. Therefore, it is most important for us to stay close to the Holy Mother. She protected and defended those apostles during those three days, sustained them. When Pentecost would come, the Holy Ghost would descend upon the Blessed Virgin Mary and the twelve apostles. And then the light of faith and that fire would be spread to the whole earth. In any case, <clears throat> consider the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who truly defeated death truly historically conquered it. 
And as St. Peter would say in his very first sermon, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. And our faith is not in vain because Jesus Christ really and truly did defeat death. He really and truly rose physically from the dead. He really and truly gave us his mother to replace a mother Eve that made the mistake of passing on the original sin to us. And so she passes on grace to us. And all of the tragedy of Adam and all the tragedy of Eve is replaced by the glory of the new Adam and the glory of the new Eve. And this glory attains its perfection on this morning of the resurrection after the completion of the victory of the crucifixion. Remember that whoever stands faithfully at the foot of the cross will necessarily have a happy ending. Will necessarily defeat Satan. So we bear the grace to stand at the foot of that cross and to persevere. And remember the Blessed Virgin Mary will sustain us. And we have this meditation this night on the resurrection of our Lord, is the, oh, the, the hundred soldiers that ran in fear, his appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the ending of sorrows, and the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy that you shall be sorrowful, but the world shall rejoice. But you shall have joy that no man can take from you. And this joy begins to enter our church and enters it fully at the moment that the Blessed Virgin Mary sees her son. And she, he sees her at the early morning of Easter. So in any case, we'll have the, go to the finishing of the Mass here. And then we'll have, after the Mass, the opening of the benediction, the opening of the exposure of the Blessed Sacrament. And then after that, the Office of Compline. And then the retreatants can go to bed, and I'll be available in the office for whoever wants to see me as long as necessary down in the office after the Office of Compliment. Then tomorrow morning, there'll be 7.30, the uh, closing of the benediction, and then Mass immediately following, and then the breakfast. So just before 7.30, there'll be the closing of the benediction, and then the Mass. And then also on the back table under the picture of the sacred heart there is the sign up sheet uh, for the whole for the hours during the night so as you can sign up on the hours during the night for the adoration to pick an hour during the night to be in the presence of our lord and there you can do your meditation and then tomorrow morning the the uh, the, the rise will be at uh, 7 a.m and then at 7 30 there will, will be in the chapel uh, or rather, no, the normal rise at 6.30 a.m. and 7 o'clock in the chapel, and then the 7.30, the uh, benediction, and then the uh, mass. So the normal rise at 6.30 a.m., 7 a.m. in the chapel, then you just uh, say your morning prayers, and then uh, the um, closing of the benediction at, or just before 7.30, and then the mass, and then the conclusion of the uh, last part of the retreat on the morrow. So do sign up the sheet. There's the sheet's not fully signed up right now. So sign up the sheet in the back of the church after the mass, uh, right before the benediction, or after the I mean, right before the compline, or right after the compline. You can sign up the sheet for the adoration tonight. Cosa bless you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.